have talked here at length about the challenges veterans face getting care, but we recently had a conversation that made us realize we're missing a big part of that story. Hope you're enjoying your day off of work today. Did you know that our state was one of the first places to embrace Labor Day? Looked at the thermostat this afternoon and I was like, good gracious, that's bodacious. We just broke a record for heat and it doesn't phase us. Let's look back at the other weird weather we've experienced in the ninth month of the year. And as we sweat, one family is enjoying the most Colorado thing we saw today. Next. We had a really insightful conversation with a veteran we want to tell you about. We were talking about veterans and suicide and the stigma that stops some people from getting the help they need. Then this veteran brought up an issue she feels is glossed over far too often. What it's like for women veterans trying to get medical help. For a little perspective, here's our Anusha Roy. For six and a half years, Jen Birch served our country in the Air Force. She was a volunteer medic and spent time in Afghanistan. Like I was watching people die every other day. She came back a changed woman whose daily routine involved PTSD, and she felt herself unraveling. Then in 2013, Birch says she tried to kill herself. And so I take this second opportunity of life to, to help others. Part of that is talking about what it's like for women veterans going to the VA for medical care. When she said this last week, you walk into a VA and sometimes there's cat calls. Or... It stuck with us. A VA spokesman acknowledged in an email some women veterans have been harassed and they're working to increase their trust so they come in for their medical care. That includes rolling out a program at all their facilities with posters, videos, and training materials to stop any harassment. Women veterans um, tend to fall behind in health care and mental health care and I know they're trying to improve it but they are they're they're behind the VA said it's made progress in recent years and now provides a variety of health care services for women like maternity gynecology comprehensive primary care and mental health services since 2008 5,800 health care providers have been trained in women's health and more than half of their employees who provide mental health services are women so in that email that we got from the VA, we heard the word now a lot. Now we're providing these services. Now we've made these changes. Well, that's going to be the second part of this story where we're working on taking a closer look at when they started making these changes. And Steve, especially because this conversation started about veterans and suicide from last week, we wanted to take that opportunity and put up the veterans crisis line again for anybody who needs it. Access that 24-7. Yeah, and when we talk about women here, we're talking about a pretty significant number. Yeah, it is 10% of the the entire veteran population are women. That number goes up, especially in rural parts of the country as well. Yeah, and we know how difficult it is to get folks in rural area health care as well. Yeah, so what the VA is doing now is that they've actually launched a mobile training that they can actually go to these different rural sites, uh, VA rural sites, and try to get the doctors and the staff there the same training that you would get in a metro area because everyone deserves to have access and a safe place to get their health care. Yeah, it's a conversation we're going to keep having here. Anusha Roy, thank you. So plans to create a new toll road to connect C-470 and Northwest Parkway are on hold. Soil samples that had elevated levels of plutonium are halting that project. Broomfield officials say they are holding off on selecting a private partner as they wait on the state health department for advice on the next steps. The new toll road would be near the old Rocky Flats nuclear weapons facility. Uh, that is why the soil samples were actually tested. While state health officials say they do not believe there's an immediate public health threat, they do want to do some further testing. When you have to collect a record number of signatures to recall Governor Jared Polis, the Labor Day holiday is not a day off. Petitioners were out in Arvada today gathering more signatures. They only have four more days to collect the 631,000 signatures they need. They are due on Friday. No petition signature gathering effort in Colorado history has needed so many signatures. If that group falls short of that number, the spokeswoman says they won't submit them. State law specifies that any voter who signs a recall petition cannot sign another recall petition for the same elected official during their term in office. A lot of people are home from work today celebrating the holiday. Did you know that Colorado was the second state to adopt Labor Day as a holiday? The Denver Public Library and History Colorado both shared some interesting facts about the history of Labor Day. In the late 1800s, the average American was working 84 hours a week just to afford basic living. That's a 12-hour shift, seven days a week. 
Oregon was the first to create an official holiday recognizing workers in 1887. Colorado was the second, adopting a Labor Day holiday on March 15, 1887. Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York all followed suit. By 1894, 23 more states had adopted the holiday. On June 28, 1894, Congress passed an act that made the first Monday in September each year a legal Labor Day holiday in D.C. and the territories. The early celebrations included parades that celebrated workers and their families. And, of course, workers also found ways to celebrate on their own. Looks like a heck of a celebration. We will post a link to an article written by an archivist at the Denver Public Library on the next Facebook page. And while we're talking about Labor Day history, may I make another recommendation? A quick read that looks at some of the influence Colorado had on creating labor laws. While Colorado was one of the first states to pass the Labor Day holiday in 1887, it was a tragedy that happened more than two decades later that really had an impact on creating an eight-hour workday and prompted child labor laws. One of the nine news digital producers put this article together looking at the Ludlow Massacre outside of Trinidad 105 years ago. The conflict began in September 1913 when 8,000 mine workers walked off the job. They were demanding a pay raise and enforced eight-hour workdays. The article looks at how the strikes led to a day-long battle that killed 25 people. We have a link to that article posted also on the next Facebook page. 100 degrees on September 2nd, the hottest it's ever been this late in the season. It got us thinking about September's past and how quickly memory can fade in the sweltering heat. Here's Noel Brennan with a bit of weather history. Dollar water right here, ice cold. And they are icy cold to the crunch. It's not a hard sell in the heat outside the taste of Colorado. The long walk back to the car, get you ice cold drink. A bargain. Thank you. On this record breaking Labor Day. I think it's 100 degrees outside. If this unseasonable heat suited anyone, you'd think it'd be Amanda yep. Summers. Doesn't mean I like the summer. <laughs> Dollar water, ice cold. Ooh, he got to be hot in that coat. Oh my God. Ice cold water for a dollar? Amanda would much prefer a September of the past. Maybe September 24th, 2000, the last time there was measurable Ooh. September snow in Denver. <laughs> wow. That'd be nice. I like the snow, so it could come any day. I'm ready. Really? Ready for the slush of September 12th, 1989? Two to three inches in Denver at least made every dog's day. I don't mind a short change. It's, uh, it'd be nice to get a, another month or so of nice weather back. Craving the cold today, Denver could not escape it on Labor Day 1961. I wasn't even born. <laughs> 33 degrees on September 3rd, more than four inches of snow in the metro and nearly a foot out west. It's a long way. Get you a dollar water here. Ice cold. At least Amanda Summers is able to make the best of the season. I like it cold, but I like it hot so I can make money. So. <laughs> For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Stay hydrated. It's hot. Sage advice. Now, Denver's first measurable snow is typically around mid-October with an average date of October 18th. Speaking of snow, on this hottest September day ever in Denver, Englewood is already planning for snow. Tomorrow night, City Council there will look at making some changes to its snow removal ordinance. Right now, property owners there have 12 hours to remove their snow from sidewalks. The city's code enforcement department suggests extending that to 24 hours. That would put Englewood in line with Denver, where you have 24 hours after a storm stops to shovel your walks. Supporters of the president gathered outside the ICE detention facility in Aurora today. They called it a Stand with ICE rally. It was, it was planned after protesters took down an American flag at that facility back in July. But ICE supporters were not the only ones there. The rally attracted more than 150 people. Many of them were protesting the rally, opponents of the recent immigration activity locally and, and, and on the border. It was a heated morning between the groups. Any productive conversation between them was hard to hear over sirens and shouting. I don't have to uh, necessarily ag uh, agree with either side of the issue, but I feel it's important to support the people that we've tasked with, with enforcing our laws. No, uh, Paul Rasmussen says he participated in the rally as a show of support for local law enforcement, not as the political standoff it turned into. After the crowds left, he suggested a conversation next time versus a rally. A Colorado task force is standing by in Orlando, Florida tonight, ready to respond to Hurricane Dorian as it moves toward them. 
West Metro Fire tweeted out that 16 members of Colorado Task Force One were in Orlando today. The crew is there to help with any water rescues that might be needed. Right now they are uh, being trained on the mobile survey and mapping system that will actually help them find stranded people. Hurricane Dorian moved over to the Bahamas and came to a halt, but activity in the atmosphere over us will eventually get moving again. This takes a meteorologist to explain. Heavy storms there and intense heat here, but that didn't keep people from enjoying their Labor Day outside. An opportunity to spend time with the folks that you don't really get to see when you're working so hard. More than a dozen Broncos are no longer wearing orange and blue. Sharon and Greeley wants to know, what happens to their jerseys? It's a great question. We'll answer it next. Again, the Broncos made their final roster cuts, had to get the team down to a 53-man roster ahead of the regular season. That led to our next question from Sharon out in Greeley. She wants to know, do the players that are cut get to keep their jerseys or what is done with them? The players do not get to keep their jerseys, Sharon. The team takes those jerseys back, removes the names, and throws it back on the rack for the next guy. New players can claim those numbers or current players can trade their numbers. The Broncos wrapped up their preseason with a win against the Arizona Cardinals on Thursday. Their next game is a Monday night game. It's the first game of the regular season against the Raiders. A week from today, you can watch it on Channel 20. September, we see you. This is a month we should be talking about the season's first snowfall, fall foliage, and what? Today, a record and all-time September high of 100 degrees. That's too warm for a lot of us. The average uh, this time of year is 84. We also just shattered a record for the month, the all-time warmest temperature we've had in the month of September. So if you're ready for a cool down, and I bet you are up in Fort Collins, Greeley, Pueblo, and Lamar, yeah, there's a cool front coming. The ridge is breaking down, and we could be 15 to 20 degrees cooler tomorrow. Now, we're not getting a lot of rain from any thunderstorms that develop along the foothills tonight or tomorrow. No relief in that way, but you can hear the wind tomorrow morning. The front comes in. There may be a few clouds in the afternoon, and we will have a comfortable back to work and back to school day with temperatures a little easier to take. And so tonight, enjoy. It's still warm out there. Fair skies, 60s, late, late tonight. Tomorrow will be cooler, mostly sunny to start. Partly sunny by the afternoon. Our high at 84, that is average. We inch up close to 90 on Wednesday through a thunderstorm in there. Thursday, the warmest day of the week. We get you into the weekend with a nice cooling trend, so a completely different weekend coming up next weekend. And how did you beat the heat today? Steve, I love it. Kids were out in the pool. A lot of the pools were closing, you know, for the season, so why not let the dogs and the ducks enjoy the day as well? Yeah, ducks like wave pools, too. Right? Yeah, right? It looks like a wave pool. Maybe it's a regular pool. <laughs> I can't tell. Thank you, Kathy. All right. Hurricane Dorian is still battering the Bahamas tonight. Today, the deadly storm weakened to slightly to a Category 4 storm. Dorian's expected to get dangerously close to the Florida coast starting tonight. So when Hurricane Dorian reached the Bahamas, it essentially got stuck there. Activity in the atmosphere over us is expected to have Dorian moving out again all the way out there on the East Coast. Nine News meteorologist Kylie Burst explains why the storm stalled and how what's happening in our area is actually going to get it moving again. Here's the deal. Hurricanes move because of what's happening in the atmosphere around them. The reason that Dorian was moving west, even as slowly as it was, was because of a high pressure system out in the Atlantic. The winds from this system were just strong enough to give it a little nudge and it moved west. Well, this high pressure system has weakened, so it doesn't have that influence anymore. And there aren't any other major storm systems strong enough right now to get it moving. So it's just kind of sitting there. That will change here over the next couple of days. We've got this strong high pressure system over the four corners. Corners, that's bringing us all of this heat that will start to weaken as it does. It'll allow the jet stream to come south and the winds from that will allow Dorian to make that turn to the north. 100 degrees. No big deal. When Coloradans have the day off, they want to go outside. When they really want to ski, they find a way to do that too, even in the summer heat. It's the most Colorado thing we saw today. Next.
gets the best views. Some people got to enjoy the day celebrating the hard work that they put in every single week. A lot of them packed into Civic Center Park for Taste of Colorado. Some were probably heading back from the high country after a weekend camping trip, while others, they just wanted a chill day in their local park. Well, this is kind of the best spot. My wife and I, we just got this set just because it was an impulse. <laughs> we're just getting together and celebrating some time, much needed time off. Uh, we figured we'd bring it to the park because why not? It's Labor Day. That was just a bad hit. I listened to a podcast on it a couple years ago, I think. I believe it was a factory labor union. An opportunity to spend time with the folks that you don't really get to see when you're working so hard throughout the year. Nobody had days off except for like three days off a year and it was kind of miserable and they fought for another day off. So I think these moments are really special when you like actually do get the people you love together. It's a time to celebrate like all the gains we had, like the ability to have a weekend, to have time off, to spend time with family. It's really hot. I think it's 97 right now. We've got a volleyball court. Last time we had it going this way, but we figured nobody's going to want to play if they don't have shades. <laughs> so we adjusted it a little bit. We're walking around. We're trying to work up a sweat so that we earn dinner tonight. <laughs> we're not following the rules super closely. A lot of people like to go camping on Labor Day weekend and the traffic just gets so crazy. You can't fit all of Colorado and taste of Colorado and apparently you can't fit all of Colorado in the mountains either, so. The, the traffic congestion can kind of put a damper on a lot of things, that's for sure. I thought it would be more packed, but I'm, it's kind of a pleasant surprise. A last taste before you don't go outside anymore or you can't go outside anymore. Uh, spending a lot of time outside, uh, trying to get good views of the mountains and enjoying good food. I'm ready for the fall. I'm ready for sweaters. Here in the U.S., Labor Day is known as the unofficial last day of summer. Don't write me emails. I said unofficial last day of summer. Other countries celebrate Labor Day or International Workers Day on May 1st or May Day. Sometimes they spell it with a U, too. Ski season will be getting started pretty soon, but one Colorado isn't waiting on the slope. She's seeking them out, and it's the most Colorado thing we've seen today. That's next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a Coloradan all dressed up for a summer ride down the slopes. Mike Smith shared this photo of his daughter Jen getting in an August run down Jones Pass. Mike says she gets at least one ski in every month of the year. She's been doing it for five years now. Jen loves to ski, decided to do this because it would be something fun to do in the off season. What's the most Colorado thing you've seen? Share it with us using the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. D wants to know, did you pilfer one of Kyle's jackets? We shouldn't have left it on his desk. We'll see you next time.